Okay, well, I'll start uh, back where I was. Um, we have two different types of infectious things out there. We've got biotic, which is living agents, such as insects and disease, animals, that sort of thing. And abiotic, which is uh, related to temperature, moisture, chemicals, things that are not living. The symptoms um, between biotic and abiotic um, can kind of be determined to some degree. When you're looking for something that's biotic, it's probably going to be non-uniform and with a clumpy type distribution. Um, usually it's host specific or limited to re related hosts, such as um, all pines or spruces, that sort of thing, as opposed to uh, maple and a spruce. <clears throat> the symptoms on an abiotic would be more uniform in pattern and more evenly distributed across the non-related hosts. Um, and these can often be confused for biotic agents. Stress is usually the main issue in urban settings. And it's related to site or environment. The most common stresses, of course, is inadequate water and extreme cold. Um, and early symptoms may, may present themselves as reduced growth um, or needle size, leaf size, abnormal foliage color, uh, vigorous water sprouting, and leaf drop or scorch. So basically, uh, you want to focus on the cause, not necessarily the damage symptoms or the insect and disease agents, because 70 to 90 percent of these problems are the result of cultural or environmental conditions. And insect and disease activity is often secondary and associated with tree stress. This, this is just some photos of girdling roots. Um, one way to tell if you've got some girdling roots is, is there a flare at the base of the tree? If there's not a flare down there, then there might be something going on underneath as far as girdling roots. And you can see what can happen. Um, trees can break off, and they can also be choke themselves to death. Iron chlorosis is very common. Um, one way to tell is to, to see that there's the, the veins are still green, but the leaves themselves are, are yellowy. Juniper and um, aspen and birch, those sort of things, are pretty common iron chlorosis issues. Leaf scorch, the uh, necrosis or dying tissue is around the tips or the edges of the leaf. And then you can have all, all three. You can have drought, scorch, and iron chlorosis all together as one. Um, this tree, I took a picture, picture of it three or four years ago, and it's no longer there. Construction damage to roots, uh, sometimes it can take upwards of 10 years for the tree to start showing um, a response to damage along the roots. Construction damage, uh, paving around the base, sun scald from a, a fence that's closer than it should be to the tree or the tree to the fence, uh, wounding from construction. And damage or exposed roots, more damage, wounding, those, those are some of the, the main um, abiotic type symptoms you might run across. Frost damage, and, and how can we tell that this is frost damage? Um, on the fur, you can see that it's just the candles that were affected, the newly forming candles, um, that fresh green tissue. And on the aspen, we've got some of the, the first flush has been damaged, but we've got some new growth coming in. And that's one way to be able to see if it's, if it's frost. Herbicide injury uh, from a broadleaf weed killer, you'll see curling and cupping, um, sometimes a leathery appearance to the, to the leaves. And this can occur either through root absorption or through volatization, which is when the herbicide liquid turns gaseous and it will float up and damage the leaves. Herbicide injury from a sterilant, so if, you know, if you've got some um, gravel around there and somebody's treated that gravel with a sterilant, it can get into the roots and damage the tree. So again, you want to focus on the cause, not only the damage, um, because most of it is going to be cultural or environmental. 
And insect disease is often this secondary, but it's not always secondary. Sometimes there are cyclic insects that have little association with stress, but they come and they go. It's like, like the fall canker worm. Um, these are the, the worms that fly, you'll hit, run into them when you're, they're hanging from a web and you can run into them, box elder, um, maple, other hardwoods. Um, here, here in Utah, we have a, a gamble oak is the most often problematic, and you'll find pockets of, of defoliation here and there across the landscape. Now the, they're called fall cankerworm because the male flies in the fall, and you can see the, the male there has wings. The female does not have wings, and she will crawl up the, the trunk and lay her eggs, which are very distinctive looking a uh, round, sort of clay-colored. Fall webworm and western tent caterpillar are, are a couple that we have some issues with, and you may um, see those driving up the canyons. The fall webworm will encase an entire branch with sort of a loose, loose web, and they'll eat within that web. That, uh, the mo most likely a host for that is chokecherry. And then the western tent caterpillar has a, a very tightly woven web, um, usually in branch crosses, and those uh, most often affected as aspen on the on that particular species. Sawflies, uh, sawfly larvae, as you can see, they they kind of hang out in a clump and they munch on on the needles, um, so you'll get this ragged, just defoliated, half defoliated needles. Um, we have seen some of this on pine as well as spruce. Aphids, um, you might get a curling and cupping with aphids too, similar to you get what you might get with uh, chemical dip damage. But if you look closer, you'll see the insects themselves, and they're pretty squishable. I mean, they're they're pretty soft bodied, and and you'll have the sticky honeydew in in it inside the the leaf. And if you look closely, you'll see those cornicles, which uh, circle there. You can see the cornicles are those two um, spikes that, that come out of the back end of the insect. Scale insects, they're also um, uh, piercing and sucking, and they, they have either a waxy or a hard cover over them, and the insect is underneath. Some of the scale that you might find uh, that is fairly common is oyster shell scale on aspen. Because aspen has such a, a thin bark, they can suck the, the phloem juice, the carbohydrates, right out of, the, out of there. Black pine leaf scale, this is one that we've been having some trouble with over the last five or so years in, in the valleys. Um, and what you might see when you're driving by is a tree that's sort of yellowish, um, and you'll have at, at the bottom picture there, you'll see where you've got um, just the newest growth clinging on. And so you get sort of this tufted appearance to the tree. And then if you get closer, you'll find the black scale or br uh, grayish bumps on the needles. And treatment is best for the crawler stage for most scale insects, this scale insect is different in that the timing for the crawler stage is in August, um, July and August as opposed to April and May. Um, so treatment is a little difficult for the crawler stage. So systemic treatment has often been the best way to go with, with uh, scale insects. Round-headed borers are um, also called longhorn beetles because of the antenna that they, they have. They're, they're quite long. Um, these are the ones that burrow right into the wood itself. And the larvae has a more of a rounded head to it. And I'll show you the, the head on the flat-headed borer, and you'll still see the difference. Flat-headed borers, um, the adults can be really quite pretty um, metallic. 
and the, they're also called metallic borers. Um, and you can see in the larvae that, that the head on it is, is flattened, and these will tunnel around in the phloem tissue, but they will go into the, into the wood to pupate. And the holes in the wood for these are more of an oblong shape, where the round-headed borers are perfectly round. Pitch mass borer is something that we've been dealing with here in the valley uh, just over the last few years, something that uh, is pretty messy. You get very large clumps of, of pitch um, along the trunk, and usually uh, at, at the branch crotches or, or around that area. Really, the only control for these is to take the pitch off and if you dig underneath, you might find the larvae. And then you just kill the larvae. Treatment, as far as chemical treatment, is not necessarily very, very uh, useful. Twig beetle in subalpine fir. Uh, probably not going to see a whole lot of this in the urban setting because subalpine fir doesn't do well in an urban setting to begin with. Um, but the, the tips or the twiglets will have a um, beetle in them, so you can imagine that this is a very tiny beetle. Um, it's cyclic, uh, meaning that it comes around every now and then uh, with no practical controls available. White pine weevil, um, this one kills about the first two feet or so of the leader. Um, it's generally found on spruce, but we have also seen it on some pine. Um, the leaders may have a shepherd's crook, which is this little crook here that you can see kind of wilting type type uh, action there. Um, and it first attacks in mid-April, so treatment would, would occur before that. You can either do a spray or a, uh, a fall treatment of systemic as a preventative. Bark beetles, um, most bark beetles uh, look the same. Um, they differ, however, in their importance. They differ in their host preferences, their life cycles, and their gallery patterns. And management is dependent upon the bark beetle species. So it's important to properly identify the beetle species before treatment. We've got Ips species and Dendrochinus. Dendrochinus is about twice the size of Ips. Ips have the, as you can see, if you look at the back end of the insect, Ips beetles will have uh, like a bite taken out, where they've got this, these spines on the rear end, where the Dendrochinus species are, are smooth. Bark beetle life cycle is egg to adult, and the time it takes to go from egg to adult varies with species, and all of that um, life cycle is carried out, well, almost all of it, except the adult is carried out under the bark in the phloem tissue. So how do, do bark beetles kill a tree? Basically, they, they chew through the outer bark into the phloem and make an egg gallery. And when they're chewing in, what you'll see is uh, the tree tries to defend itself, and so it'll, it'll throw out some pitch, and you'll get these pitch, what are called pitch tubes. The eggs are laid in the gallery there, which you see on the bottom picture. Um, and that, those hatch, and then the individual larvae go out, and um, basically they, they eat in the phloem and girdle the tree. Then they pupate at the end of their gallery and chew their way out through the bark, and those are the, the holes that you see that are um, like BB-sized holes. So how do we recognize bark beetle attack? Um, signs and symptoms vary by species, but general things are the foliage fades, uh, turns yellow or red depending upon the species of tree. Yellow mostly for spruce, red for pine. Tree uh, exudes the pitch, like I was talking about earlier, um, pitch tubes. Reddish boring dust, which is frass, and bark crevices are around the base of the tree, and then galleries under the bark. Diagnosis of the, of the beetle species can often, often be done by knowing the, the host species and looking at the gallery patterns. As you can see, there, there are several different types of gallery patterns here. Um, Ips has 
has a very uh, sort of a, a Y-shaped pattern, and it's because it's a polygamous species where the others aren't. This is basically what you might see with ifs. Uh, some of the first symptoms are a dead top or individual branches. Now, the dead top is different than what I was talking about earlier with white pine weevil in that it's usually three to five feet of the top. By the time you notice the top going, the beetle has moved on and attacked a lower down in the tree or another tree. So this is just some photos of the frass there, sort of an orange uh, dust, pitch tubes, galleries. First attack for imps is usually in mid-April, and they only have a six to eight week life cycle. So you might get three to five generations per season, depending upon the temperature and how late your fall is. So this is the size of an Ips um, comparison, and you can see a lot better what the, the bite out of the rear end looks like. Ips versus pity. Now, we have seen a little bit of Pityopterus, Pityopteritines. There are several different species of pity. Um, it's about half the size of the ifs, and it is usually secondary and only in dying branches of trees. Ips and graver and other bark beetle control. Um, so your best preventative is going to be prevention. Um, so reduce the stress to the trees, because these beetles are really only attracted to trees that are under stress. Treatment is preventative, and it's not curative. Once the tree is infested, um, you that part of the tree that is infested is, is not going to live. So heavily and currently infested trees will need to be removed and disposed of properly, meaning that you either chip it or you take it to the where it's at least a mile or so from any um, species that uh, is susceptible to this beetle. There are many brands of insecticide registered. Um, in Utah and other, other states, because I've seen that there are some other states here uh, on this call, um, you'll have to check your, your state regulations on, on registrations. But in Utah, the, the best and most accurate uh, or consistently effective ingredient is carbaryl. Um, some of you may know that as seven. Uh, if it's applied correctly, which is a 2% active ingredient solution, uh, provide 16 to 18 months of protection against if beetle attack. Uh, systemic insecticides will not work for most phloem feeders. So for flat-headed borers or for bark beetles, systemic insecticides just don't seem to work well. Red turpentine beetle, also another uh, bark beetle that is associated with tree stress. This is an, a dendrochinus, and you can see the round round rear end there on that one. These attack only the three to five feet of the trunk of the base. And this is something new that we've been seeing over the last five years. Um, it's starting to pick up uh, more populations and be becoming a, a pretty big problem here. So you're basically be looking for reddish sawdust around the base, um, fairly big size clumps of pitch or pitch tubes. And this, this particular beetle is, is a fairly good size, about twice the size of most of the bark beetles. And um, they have a different sort of gallery in that they eat as a, as a group as opposed to individual. So you look for galleries under the bark um, that are just basically a big fan of, of uh, defoliation, or not defoliation, but uh, phloem being munched on. Western pine beetle, um, usually I wouldn't say that this is a problem, but I've seen it just a few weeks ago in uh, Cottonwood Heights. So it is, it is in, the, in the city here. Um, this is another one that only goes after trees that are under stress. Um, it ha can have two to three generations per year, 
they start to fly in early May or June. Um, and you'll look for pitch tubes uh, mostly near the base and up to about 40 feet. The gallery pattern underneath is a winding type pattern as opposed to um, some of the other patterns. It's a very distinctive pattern for western pine beetles. Let's go back here. Um, for pine beetles, the treatment is the same as, as, as it is for ips, for all of these pine, all of these bark beetles um, that I've been talking about, is the preventative treatment, the preventative spray treatment. Um, now for the, the western pine beetle and the red turpentine beetle, even though the trees only attack toward the base, you can spray just the base and control that particular beetle. Uh, but these trees being even more stressed are now um, susceptible to Ips beetle, which will attack anything that's three-quarter of an inch in diameter and larger. So if you're going to recommend anybody spray, probably want to spray for Ips too, as opposed to just for the uh, turpentine and the, and the western pine. Oops. Sorry. OK, um, moving on to diseases. Um, unless you want to take a break and to ask me some questions, I'll move right along. Hey, Colleen, this is Rose. It looks like we don't have any questions yet, so you can go ahead and keep on presenting. OK, okay thank you, Rose. Um, so diseases, uh, here in Utah, uh, it, they're not real prevalent because of our dry conditions and hot environment. There are four requirements that are necessary for a tree disease to become serious. Um, first of all, you have to have a susceptible, a susceptible host because most pathogens are host specific. A pathogenic organism, meaning the pathogen itself, um, an environment that's suitable to this disease to develop, and timing, the right timing. The severity and extent depends upon the resistance and the health of the tree or a plant, um, the virulence of the pathogen itself, and environmental conditions. Um, the part of the tree affected determines the significance of the disease. If it's foliage, then it's not usually that big of a problem unless defoliation occurs um, over several years. Branches, a little bit more of a problem. Trunk, absolutely a problem. Roots, definitely a problem. Anthracnose is one that we've been having trouble with over the last few years um, because we've had springs where it's been cold and wet. And that's what you need for anthracnose to develop. Um, the amount of anthracnose that, that uh, develops is dependent upon how wet and what the temperatures are. If the temperature is between 50s and 60s, it's going to be pretty bad. If it's, if it's above 60, not so bad. If it's below 50, not so bad. So crown symptoms when you're driving by and you're looking at the crown, um, the lower part will be defoliated uh, more toward the base, and then you'll have large leaves um, sort of at, and greener at the top. Black leaf spot or Marcinona leaf spot um, got uh, pretty much the same conditions as far as a cold wet spring. Um, aspen and cottonwood are the main, main problems with this one. Um, so early light infection, you have just a few small sp spots moderate infection and heavy infection, um, you'll see early defoliation. Really, the, one of the, there are some things that you can do about these. Um, you can do a, a preventative treatment in the spring before um, just at bud break. And then if it's still raining, you might have to do it again in seven days. Um, and then, of course, remove all of the fallen leaves from the year before to prevent that uh, pathogen from being quite so much uh, availability. Cankers, um, 
if you can remove the bark around a canker, it'll show you the margin of the, the dead tissue. Um, they usually attack trees that are under stress and generally enter through bark crevices or wounds. So what one way that we can tell a canker or a wound, because uh, oftentimes a canker looks like a wound and a wound looks like a canker. And if you'll note here, a canker often will have a branch stop right in the middle of it. So you'll have the, the sunken or dead tissue around this branch stop. And here again, we've got uh, blackened dead tissue right around a branch. Um, and if you look closely enough at the right time, you might see the sporodokia um, or the, the fruiting bodies of the canker disease. Victoria canker of cottonwood, again, dead tissue, sunken tissue, infection through um, stems or branches. Honey locust. I've seen pretty much most of these cankers uh, over the last 16 years here and there. They're not real, real prevalent here, but uh, you, you might run into them every now and then. Phytospora canker um, is one that is, is pretty widespread over several different species of trees, and the tree is, de is definitely associated with stress. So if you can keep your trees healthy, you probably won't have too much uh, Cytospora canker. Uh, Lombardi poplars, um, they are so susceptible to this canker disease that you don't even need to have much damage or much uh, stress or wounding or anything else to, to get a pretty bad uh, infection of, of this disease. Um, sometimes you'll find other canker diseases moving in on dead or dying branches, and so it might be confusing looking at it. Um, you might think you've got cytospora when in fact it's, it's this particular disease that's the main, the main problem. Slime flux, frothy flux, basically bacterial wetwood. Um, you'll find this here and there. Uh, elms and cottonwoods are generally the main hosts. Um, globe willow uh, with the frothy flux is the main host for that in this area. Um, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot you can do about that. That's just one of the issues of having cottonwood, elm, and globe willow. So we'll move on to gall makers. Um, these can be, galls can be formed from insects, mites, diseases. Uh, a gall is basically an overgrowth or swelling of, from hormonal changes in the plant, which stimulate rapid or abnormal plant growth. So galls may be found on any part of the plant, um, including leaves, petioles, roots, basically anywhere. Some common galls include the honey, honey locust pod gall midge. Uh, this is a, a small aphid-like insect that creates a gall uh, with the leaves, so you've got these little pods um, on your honey locust. Oak gall wasp. Um, to get the little balls on the leaves and the twigs. Poplar twig, twig gall fly, um, generally on, on uh, poplars, uh, get this round sort of growth on, on the, the branches and the twigs. All three of those that I talked about are insect related, and then the black knot disease is, on chokecherry is a, a disease, so it's a, fun, a fungus related. Mite galls, um, generally cottonwoods, for the most part elms, um, you get sort of this reddish leathery um, or red sort of balls, um, tissue that is pretty, pretty distinctive for mite galls. Cooley spruce gall adelgid, I think everybody's probably seen this one. Um, uh, the, the galls will form on the spruce. Uh, basically, the, the it's a it's an aphid. Uh, Adelgid is basically the same, same thing as an aphid, and it, it gets into the the stem, and what you think might be a 
cone from afar, if you get close, you'll see that, that it's really um, a swelling of the stem with uh, needles coming out of that. Um, fresh galls are still green. Um, older galls will turn brown or gray. Um, this, this one has a very complex, complex lifestyle or life cycle, and um, it's got a secondary host on the Douglas fir. So if you have a Douglas fir in the area, you're going to have worse issues on your spruce. Spruce, however, the, the galls can develop on their own. They don't need to have that secondary host. Um, control for this is not really needed usually. Um, it's more of an aesthetic issue, unless it gets really bad, and then you might get some dieback. Um, but you can prune out the green galls and then destroy them, burn them, or whatever. Mites, um, spider mites are one of the more common ones that you might run into. Um, spider mite webbing is different than regular spider webbing in that it's exceptionally fine. And one way to tell, uh, of course, you'll get the stippling on the, on the needles or the leaves. And then if you look through, through the branch or the, it's, you look for the webbing through kind of the light so you can see through it through the sunlight. And um, if you see some webbing, then, then you might have uh, spider mites. Um, spruce is one of the major ones that gets this one. It can be made worse through uh, dust in the air or too much nitrogen in the, in the tree. Sapsucker damage. Uh, this one I get a lot when people call me and they say, oh, I have holes in my trees. I think I have beetles. Um, one way to tell uh, whether it's sapsucker is there's a pattern to it. Um, and if you look closely at these photos, you can see that they're, they're in a line. The holes are in a line, whether it's crossways or up and down. Um, they're in sort of a line or a checkerboard pattern. And that's a bird that uh, they'll come back year after year and uh, go after the same tree, which is kind of weird. But that's, uh, that's the way it works. Not much you can do about that. So basically, to tie things up, uh, we want to use integrated pest management as much as possible. That means using all your tools in your toolbox. So maintain your tree health and cultural conditions uh, that are preventative measures for insect and disease. Before initiating any controls, however, you might want to ask yourself, is a control really needed? We have a little bit of aphids on the tree. Is, is that going to really be a problem for the tree or do I need to treat? Um, so you might want to think about that before just starting to spray. Determine the stress factors and, and countermeasures that are the underlying problem uh, for the insect and disease issue. Identify the pest properly because it is essential for choosing the right control actions. You need to know the life cycle of the of the insect or disease in order to um, treat it at the right time of year and in the right way. So learn which conditions promote common insects and diseases and try to avoid them. For example, like I was talking about the, the spider mites and the high nitrogen levels in, in spruce. So if you're using pesticides, you got to know the life cycle of the pest because it's, it's super important. Uh, for the timing. Um, check if you can use a biological insecticide or cultural practices um, instead of using a broad spectrum chemical which can kill beneficial insects as well as non-target insects. Um, for example, a biological control for, let's say, the fall canker worm. I said that the female crawls up the trunk the tree to lay her eggs in, in the fall. So if we put sort of a tacky substance or a tanglefoot around the base of the tree, that might prevent her from being able to crawl up there. Um, these types of, of things, if we can figure out a biological way to control them, that, that would be best. So basically, use inter inter 
integrated pest management whenever it's possible um, because you're going to get a better result in the end if we reduce the stress as well as treat for the insect. This is just a really, a really great website um, that you can go and search for pesticide registrations. Um, I like to go in to this site and go into search by pest because we know what the pest is. Now we need to figure out what treatment we can use for it. Um, we can find out more about the life cycle on the internet um, and then figure out how to treat that. Um, you don't need to really know all of that stuff in your head, but, you, but determining what the insect or disease is is very important. And then we can search by pest and they'll pull up all the registered um, products for treatment in Utah. I think, I don't know if they have one for Nevada. I know there's somebody on here from Wuhan. So, but anyway, um, that's basically all I have on the presentation. Um, it may have been a review for many of you, but I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much, Colleen. This is Rose again. Um, it does look like we have at least one question for you. Uh, somebody is asking if you have any advice for treating fire blight, especially on calorie pears. Well, you definitely want to remove the, the infected tissue in, in the fall uh, or you know prune, the, prune out the infected tissue when possible and then if we've got the right conditions in the spring, um, you might want to do a, a preventative treatment with a fungicide or a bactericide, excuse me, because it's bacteria as opposed to being a, a fungus. And it looks like we have another question for you, Colleen. What do you recommend for treatment for an areophyte mite? Sorry if I messed that up. I'm not a pest specialist. There's not a whole lot of um, miticides available anymore. Um, but treatment with a miticide would be best if you could find one. Um, you can search by that, that particular pest on this website that, that I've got showing here and see what, what is registered for use and available. Um, sometimes a good systemic insecticide will work uh, to prevent um, these types of, of mites as well. Thanks for that answer, Colleen. All right, if you're still there, Colleen, we have another question from an audience member. Uh, what about verticillin wilt? Is that a problem in Utah? I have not seen much of verticillium wilt in Utah. Uh, however, it has been uh, found here and there. Uh, to determine whether it's verticillium wilt, you'll have to find the flagging uh, limb, remove it, and then check underneath the, the bark for that staining that is typical for verticillium wilt. Um, and if you still have questions, uh, usually verticillium wilt is lethal and, and the tree will not recover. So making sure that there's no grafts between trees uh, is, is a good way to go there. So you might want to remove that tree. First of all, you have to determine if indeed it is verticillium wilt. So you can send a, a sample to a pathologist. I think that uh, Utah State University has, has that ability to determine whether or not it is indeed verticillium wilt. And if it is, you probably want to remove that tree and sever the roots, root connections between that tree and uninfected trees. And hopefully you got it before it got to the other tree. 